so excited to be able to introduce to you today, Deborah Stewart. And she is an incredible woman that is also in the trades industry and has been for quite some time. And man, the conversations that we've already had have been so stellar. I'm so excited to record it this time. We had to stop talking when we got on here so we could start recording this. But she is the owner of Stewart Builders and Stewart Environmental Remediation. And they do all kinds of incredible construction work. And that is a huge job for a woman that is in a male dominated industry. So I can't wait for this conversation today. Deborah, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you give everybody a little bit of your backstory, who you are and why you choose to work in the home service industry? Okay, so um, I'm Deborah Stewart. Um, I've been in construction since 1999. The way it started was my husband was a realtor working for a few builders. And it honestly started as if they can do it, we can do it. And mm -hmm. I paid $200 to the state of New Jersey. Poof, we had a builder's license. We uh, talked a few people into selling us some pieces of property for no money down, no interest, no payments for six months. Got a couple of lots. Um, talked the bank into giving us a construction loan. Started a spec home. Talked somebody else into buying a pre-sale. Sold the other lot. And it just kind of went from there. And then through the years, we... We did build several new construction homes for families. And through the years, it just metamorphosed more into excavating and then into environmental remediation. So that part was always a big part of it. But now that's really the, the majority of it. So we've specialized in environmental remediation as the years have gone on. So when you say environmental remediation for people that don't know what that is, what is that work exactly? Okay, so um, we are licensed. It's a special license, and you have to have X amount of years of experience to get the license. And it's we can remove underground oil tanks or gasoline tanks or hydraulic lifts and car repair shops. Anything that's containing a petroleum type of a substance under the ground or above the ground and dispose of it and remove and dispose of soil that's been contaminated by not just petroleum-based substances, but also other lead, arsenic, there's all kinds of things. Dry cleaners are notorious for contamination. So interesting. Yeah. Dry cleaners. What is their contamination? Like, what is it? It's, you know, they've got some pretty bad chemicals. Um, I can't tell you the exact name of them because there's several and they're long names, but they're, yeah. they can be very hazardous. They are not good chemicals. And uh, I know years ago we had done one dry cleaner. It had it had leached down in the soil many feet below the building. So we actually had to support the building with something called helical piers and then dig it out from under the building. Yeah. So when they pull tanks out like that, do they do you have like people like people that come in and do like soil testing afterwards to make sure everything is all clean? Like how do they determine what you need to take out? Okay, so generally, for the most part, we work for LSRPs, which are environmental engineers that are licensed to oversee environmental work in New Jersey. And we're, we're licensed in a few other states, but every state has their own name. But so for, for this purpose, it's LSRPs. So they'll hire us like somebody like Kmart or UPS or Penske Trucking will hire an LSRP to come in and then they'll hire us. We're the company that has the big equipment and the license to pull the tank. So once the tank has been pulled, the LSRP, even if it doesn't appear as though there's any contamination in the bottom of the excavation, they take soil samples from the sides and the bottom of the excavation just to make sure. And, yeah. then, it, and then it's on the record permanently with the DEP that the tank was removed, there was no contamination, or if there was, they sample until we get clean. Interesting. So when they clean that, do they have to do like a chemical treatment to it? Do they have to like pull out all that dirt and bring in like new native soil? Like what do they do? Generally, um, everything we've always done, although there are chemical injections, but we've always done remove all of the soil, stockpile it, and then it needs to get approved into a disposal facility. So we've got to take samples on the dirty dirt. That needs yeah. to go to a facility, takes a couple of weeks, and then we load it out into trucks and off it goes to the facility for disposal. 
Very interesting. So let's say there's dirty dirt. I'm fascinated by this because people always ask me questions too. Like in my septic truck, they're like, where do you take all that shit? And I'm like, <laughs> the same place that the sewer runs it to. I'm just your, I'm your sewer line. <laughs> you know, that's what my truck is. But people are always asking all the time, like, well, what do you do with this stuff? So I'm fascinated too. Like sometimes if we pump stuff, like for example, we've been to a place before to pump the septic tank. Looked like a drug house from the get go, but when we opened it up, that tank was like red because there's like the phosphorus and shit that they use to make meth out of this that they wash down the drains. Wow. And when it goes, people think like, oh, I flushed it. No one knows. They probably didn't even know they lived on a septic system. But when right. we open up those tanks like that, like if my truck touched that stuff, they test all the waste that I take into the disposal facility to make sure what it is. Like, is it the right levels for residential septic? Like, does it have chemical toilet waste in it? Because that will actually raise the pH level because of the chemicals that go in that. So there is different kinds of disposal for different kinds of things. You know, obviously with the red glowing tank, now we have to call hazardous waste because although we're hauling poop, that's not considered hazardous waste. So do you end up having to pay more as a result of that? We would, if I would have pumped that, like a lot of times people will put like these ports in their septic tank yeah, and be like, we'll oh, just pump it from the port. Never, ever, ever. Cause you never know what is inside of that tank. If I load that up in my truck, now I can't do anything with it because one, I didn't have a license to pump it and two, I don't have a license to discharge of it. So I yeah. don't have anywhere to take it. So when you when you find that dirty dirt or that contaminated dirt, can you take it to landfills? Is there certain processes that they have to do with the environment? There's it you know, it depends on if it's um we have several different facilities and and contractors that we work with that work with multiple disposal facilities. So depending on what it is, so if it's petroleum, I'll get in touch with one guy. If it's lead based, I'll get in touch with another guy. If it's got multiple things, I'll get in touch with a different guy altogether. So it really mm -hmm. just has we kind of have people at facilities that cater to different types of contamination. Sure. Sure. How interesting. So let's say for example, it's a fuel tank that yep. you have. Do they have to like gas stations, do they have to replace those at a certain period of time or do they just rip them out when they finally take the gas station out or what does that look like? Okay. So I don't know what the law is, but I know many of them and other, other facilities like hospitals think, you know, come, Commercial buildings that have large tanks will have some sort of protocol in place so that they're replacing those tanks before there's any chance they can start leaking. Because by that constant every 10 years or 15 years maintenance, then they bypass a giant cleanup, which is extremely costly. Sure, sure, sure. That's how it is. I mean, even like with the septic industry, people are like, well, how long do these tanks last? I'm like, Depends on how well you take care of it. You know, it's one of those things. Sometimes we see tanks from the 50s that are so kicking ass and you're like, how is this possible? And then you see stuff from like early 2000s and the concrete they used to make it was crap and it's corroding and falling apart already. So that too. Is very interesting. And also the ground conditions, you know, the ground conditions are a consideration yeah. of how long something's going to last in the ground. Yes, that makes a big difference. Yeah, with with any of that, the metal tanks that go in there, the concrete that goes in there, yeah. that actually happened in a neighborhood around here too. Like they did, there was something in the soil that was making the foundations like start to crumble on like these big like neighborhoods mm -hmm. of track homes they had put in, and there was like this big lawsuit thing going on with all of this. But you know that quick construction like that, sometimes they don't follow through on all their testing properly, and then I they have huge issues later. I know somebody that owns a home in Connecticut that of many of the homes, the, the concrete uh, walls have failed and it's, it's a huge thing, but they can't even go after the company that built the homes because they're out of business. Oh, uh, yeah. Sadly, a lot of that happened. You know, yeah. it does. Yeah. Construction yeah. can sometimes be a fly by night situation. Well, speaking of that, you're a woman that's in a male dominated industry like myself. And I love to talk to women on this podcast about that. And people love to listen to it because they're like, it's so interesting. It's the things that a lot of people don't think about a lot of the times. What is something working in the construction industry that surprised you that you really love about this industry? 
And then on the converse of that, what is something that really drives you nuts about this industry? Okay. Actually, I think after, you know, after a few years of getting going and getting my bearings and getting some experience under my belt, I actually think I've had an easier time as a woman, not because I'm a woman, just because I'm somebody that comes to the table competent. And that goes a long way because, you know, when people show up for their jobs, they want to be able to work. So, you know, we've got to just, as long as everything and the details are taken care of and the job is going smoothly, everybody's happy. So I think, I think it's actually been honestly easier dealing with inspectors for me. Um, I sometimes attribute it to a lack of testosterone, which could be completely wrong, but I just think that, um, (laughs) You know, it's been easy because even though things aren't necessarily always perfect, but but it's not a a fight. It's just like, okay, this is something you have to take care of or everything's great and you're fine. But I've never had any issues with inspectors ever. Nice. That's good. Yeah. Or the trade, you know, the various trades or subcontractors that we've dealt with through the years, other than those few beginning years when I didn't know anything. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of the times too, in the trades that people, they're kind of like, uh, like maybe some of these good old boys are kind of like, well, you get it easier because you're a woman. And you're like, no, I know what I'm talking about. They're not treating me any differently because of that. Because I know when I first started in this industry too, and you show up and you don't know what you're talking about, whether you're a man or a woman, they're going to eat you alive. They don't really yeah. give a shit whether you're a man or a woman, but no. do you know what you're talking about? Yes. You know? which I think can be a fallacy in this because so many times people are like, Oh, well, that's an odd industry for you to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Like what made you want to do that? Like I love educating people and getting in and being able to help. So many people that call my office are women. More of them are women than men and they don't know what the hell they need. And there's, they, they've already called around and got a bunch of people that didn't spend any time with them. If I ask you how your day's going, I'm going to get that job because I know how people answer the phones in this industry. You know, well, if it they, is one if they of the answer the phone. Yeah. Oh, good point. Very good point. But it's just so like, meh, 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 meh. and it's not like there's nothing that's personalized with it. So mm-hmm. I think that's been almost a superpower of things too, is the ability for women to be able to connect with either, you know, men or women. Absolutely. Have you found like, that too with things? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think just spending time with people and, you know, I really, it, I don't know about in Arizona, but out here in New Jersey, good luck getting somebody to answer the phone. So um, we actually have on our trucks, we answer the phone. It's on all our trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. <laughs> And you know what? You uh, you would probably be shocked if you knew how many people called you because it said that. Because I don't know about you, but like my trucks are rolling billboards going down the road. Like you want them to have all the info that you want people to know about you. So many times, you know, like, oh, I got, you know, people will say that when they call the office too. Like I got this live person, you know, like, oh my gosh. Or like, I'll take the phones on the weekends and people will be like, "Uh, I wasn't expecting you to answer. I hate to bother you. And I'm like, no work is work, you know, I'll answer the phone whenever I have it. But yeah, that, is, that is true. That, that gives you a leg up right there. If you're in the home service industry, Absolutely. answer your phones. And how yeah. many times have you heard people in the trades? I hear this all the time. doesn't matter what trade it is. If they're a younger company or it's like owner operator type of situation, I can't afford to have somebody answer my phone. So I'm like, how many calls are y'all missing? Because no one is there and dedicated to paying attention to your customers. Right. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, Huge. It all there. Yeah. That is, if you're just building and you're in any kind of business like that, I always tell people when I'm, I'm working with people that are starting a new business, when I, when they're like, well, well, who should my first hire be? I'm like, whatever your biggest time suck is. If you're constantly getting interrupted to answer the phone to do everything, that should be your first thing. If you're missing phone calls, that's money going out the door because anyone in the home service industry is just going down the list on Google, just calling people that will actually answer their phones. Absolutely. I agree a thousand percent because I do it every day myself. (laughs) (laughs) 
as providers and consumers, we can confirm that that is the actual truth. Absolutely. Well, what is something in the, being in the trades industry that is not your favorite thing about this industry? Well, I mean, I think construction in general is just kind of um, problems all day, every day, just resolving. It's just resolving problems. That's that's what it is. That's what the day consists of resolving problems. So, yeah, you know. So that's mm-hmm. not always a fun thing, but it's, it's part of it. It's, it's, it's part of it. And it's what gives you value to be able to, to resolve the problems. For sure. I think we've been really trying hard this past year to put together like systems and processes and get things written down and get it out of my brain and, and whoever the person is, you know, that's holding on to the info, like get it down so we can hire people and it's easier to train them. But so many times people are like, you know, well, we need, we need to know what to do with this, or we need to know, need to do what, or know what to do with this. You know, you do excavation work, shit's underground. You never know what you're running into. You can call utility markers out all day long to run, come mark out everything. You start digging down, you're like, well, that doesn't feel right. And then there's some mysterious secondary gas line running through this property that no one seemed to know anything about that went to who knows where. So it's different all the time with stuff. How do you find in your business that you're able to kind of process things, like set up a process around things, but still be open to all of those, like every job is a new adventure. Well, you know, we process what we can and we handle on the fly what we have to. So yeah. when something happens unexpected, you know, the the big machines, you know, four counties away and it blows a hose, I got to find a place in that area, wherever they are, to replace the hose and quick. So it's not down for the whole day. Yeah. You know, so just stuff like that happens all the time. Do you think with the nature of this business of where it is so different every day, does that, is that a difficult thing for, to hire for? And what I mean by that is like, sometimes people get into this rhythm of like, I like to come in and do my same thing and do this every day. And I want a time block and I want to do this. And I'm like, How do you do that? Because my life is very much like yours. Like it depends on what happens that day. If the guy blows a tire out and he's 40 miles away, my mobile guy is not going out that far. I got to find a whole new guy. So like one of the biggest things for me when I hire people is like, I'm going to give you a problem and you tell me how you'd solve this. Oh, I like because that. they're real life problems that are going to happen. That's like, like if I'm gone on a trip somewhere or if I'm not reachable, who in this building is going to be able to handle this stuff and how resourceful can you be with that and that has been a very difficult thing to find so when i'm interviewing not that not that we find the perfect people but we actually have a a, a pretty good crew but the thing is with the two companies we can just you know one day we can be pulling out a tank the next day we could be taking apart a metal staircase for structural reinforcing so things can really change from day to day here Mm -hmm. so generally when I'm interviewing them I let them know that every day is most likely going to be different and uh, and Mm -hmm. actually a lot of the people say that they enjoy that because doing the same thing every single day can become monotonous so so most of them want that actually not that they can handle it well or do it well um but they but they prefer it because it does it does reduce the monotony. Sure. And I think it's one of those two where it depends on what they were doing before they got there too. Like were you doing the same thing day in and day out or were you in a job where you had that that flexibility variety. of things being different? Yeah, variety. That's a much better word than flexibility. You have to be flexible because of the variety. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And and they are. And they yeah. are. Yes, yes. So with your family or with your business, does your family work with you? Do you work with your spouse? Like, Mm -hmm. how does that work? So my husband and I have been, we've been married since 95. So whatever that is, I think like 28 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've been working together since 99 and maybe even a little bit earlier because we did some real estate together there for a little bit. So We've been working together a long time. So, you know, that comes with pros and cons. You can imagine, you know, mm-hmm. pros is we're, we're both on the same 
team and we really want to make the business successful and he's got um, skill sets that I don't have. So we complement each other's skill sets. So, so that's the problem. The con is, you know, both having strong personalities and working together all day long and handling yeah. problems together all day long. Yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, I don't need to know, ask him how his day was because I already know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have that. I have that too. Because my husband came to work for my business in 2020. And um, yeah, some, some days are better than others. You yeah. know, yeah. there's like that little thing where it's, you have to be, we've decided that we have to be very um, open in the communication of the fact of like, especially if everybody kind of had a shitty day or if it was one of those days where there was a lot of weird things that happened that day, like we're going to table this and we'll talk about it again tomorrow because there's so many people in this industry that do work together. And I think a lot of women find themselves getting into this home service and trades industries because of their spouse or partners that they're with. And so it is so important to be able to have that great communication and, and not take it personally when oh, things go awry or differently in the business. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this at home. Let's go home and let it go. Let's sleep on it. We'll talk about it tomorrow thing. Because, man, I had a business with my ex-husband before too. And oh, I'm like, <laughs> how fast can I get out of here? <laughs> yeah. Many people that work in a business together, though, that like you said, are have very strong personalities. Most people that start businesses have a pretty damn strong personality or else they wouldn't have the gump to get in there to do it in the first place. So right. it's really like having that communication about who does what and being able to shut it off. Are you guys able to do that at the end of the day? Pretty you successful. I'm, I've actually been counseled to like at the end of the day, because I can talk about it for 24 seven, which is not <laughs> good. You know, I do need. So I'm actually working on myself. He's good. He can shut it off end of the day on the weekend, put it away. Um, I need to, I need some work on that and I am working on it. That's good. Well, awareness is step one, they say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right. I, I'm with you a hundred percent, Deborah, cause I could just keep going forever because yeah. I think too, in the roles that we fully fill inside of these businesses, your work is never done nope. ever. Like I'm never like, I'm never bored and I'm never done. Those are two things that I never am. And it's really evaluating those things of like, one, how can I get some of this off of my plate? So maybe I don't feel so overloaded all of the time, but really giving yourself grace and saying, I am not the identity of a business owner. I'm actually a person in here too. And that, that does take some time. Yeah. Yep. So doing better. The weekend. Good. Yeah. We just had a major reset. We went away on vacation for 11 days. So. We good just had you. a really good reboot. And you know what? Sometimes you got to do that. You just got to take off. We're leaving tomorrow too for an event in California for a couple of days. And I'm like, even though it's kind of an event situation, it's just like getting out of what the normal flow is all the Absolutely. time. Yes. And just spending some time together outside of the problems that are coming all the time. So yeah, I think just that's a, really good. And important. Change scenery. That's a world of good sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. So I would love to talk to you too. Um, if anybody listens to this podcast, they know I talk about it. I'm a huge advocate for talking to kids and younger adults about opportunities that are available in the trades industries and what that looks like and that that is and can be a very successful career path for somebody, not a, oh, I fucked up and I didn't go to college. So now I get stuck doing this. Right. Um, before we hit record on this, I was telling Deborah that we, I was having a conversation with, with some kids from my daughter's school and we were talking about um, whether people still go to school to be plumbers anymore. And I'm like, do you live in a house? You know, <laughs> like, of course people still go to do that, but we know hiring in these industries, it's becoming 
less and less of a skill set that like I grew up in Wyoming in a construction family. So maybe I just took that for granted. This is something that everybody learned growing up. Mm-hmm. But now I've like come to the city and I'm I'm trying to hire people for this. And I'm like, okay, I need to find the horse properties where I know the farm kids are at because I know they <laughs> learned how to do this stuff. Right. But I think it's, a lot of it is because the parents aren't talking to the kids about this as a viable option. Like their parents did still hold some of those jobs. How do you feel about all of that? Well, I certainly think the younger generation is a digital generation and, you know, they just haven't had the same outside time that perhaps you and I had growing up. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, uh, an office computer job is probably more on the horizon of a lot of the younger kids than a physical job would be. Mm-hmm. Because there hasn't just been a lot of physicality in their in their upbringing, because it's just a different world now. Sure. How do you think we, as people that are in this industry, like I will tell you, the last two years has been the hardest time to hire labor field technicians for my company than it has been the whole fifteen years I've been in business. We had a gentleman just today. No show, no call. Don't know if he's dead. Like people laugh at me when I say this, but straight up has been working here for three and a half weeks, trained, almost ready to go out on his own route. No call, no show. Like I, I've literally been worried about him all day because he's pretty good. If something's goofy, like we don't even know where he, what happened. All right. Did you come? Did you not come? Our fuel card is missing. Like, what is happening here? You know, there's just random things that keep happening all the time and they'll interview really good and they even come in and work good. And then it's just like dries up and I don't know what happens to them. And it's so interesting. And it's not just, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? It's not just me. It's even, I was talking to some carpet cleaners today that were in my house and they were talking about how they can't get people to come in and stay working there. Cleaning carpets, which is like nothing like pumping septic tanks, but it's crazy what the opportunity is because this like plumbing, the carpet cleaning, the the septic systems, things like that. Restaurants aren't going away. Homes that are on septic and plumbing aren't going away. People still need to dig holes and build houses and do all of this stuff. What do we do to try to recruit some of these younger people into looking at this as an opportunity? Because it's almost like if they talk about it, that people are like, really? You want to do that? It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it probably is a little bit maybe looked down on to have a trades job versus an office computer. Marketing seems to be super hot right now as oh, a, yeah. as a career path. You know, so I think I think it's just a digital world that that they're from and that's what they expect to do. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what happens. There are, you know, of course, there are some kids that that are on the football team and they're out playing soccer and they are out doing stuff. So not everybody's sitting at home playing video games, but a lot of them are. Yeah. You know, so I guess it's just going to be that that few and far between. So, I, you know, I really think and I might be completely wrong in this. It's a great time to make money because if you want to work, a lot of people don't. So you can do really well if you want to work. Yes. And if you are an owner of any of these home service businesses, trades businesses, you are going to be able to pick up companies for nothing. Yeah. Because people for generations have started a business and then the son takes it and then the grandson takes it over. And now the grandson's like, uh, nope. hell no, I don't want that. They really have just like passed it down generational. They have a great, great reputation. That good phone number, good, consistent customers might be something that's like this kind of dark horse business that maybe investors aren't going to look at, but you're going to be able to pick it up for hardly anything. If you know how to do it, employ people, put your marketing machine behind it and have an incredible business in no time. We have some people here with us that they purchased, um, they rent in the same place as us and they purchased a, uh, 
a gas company. So they run like secondary lines for pools and like barbecues and fire pits and stuff. And they had been doing residential for years. I think the guy had been in business like 20 or 30 years and they were running that, doing all that. The guy bought it for like hardly anything, put in a commercial division of this, knocked out pretty much all the residential stuff and is doing over a million dollars a month in business now. Wow. He didn't even pay that much for the business itself, I don't think. So I mean, I don't, I don't even know. Like he came in, he was like, Haifa, it's our first million dollar month. And I'm like, okay, first of all, the other guy that owned this business never came in here celebrating shit. So <laughs> I love you already, you know, <laughs> like they're such great people, but I'm like, he probably picked this up for what he's making in one month now because he came in and applied some new business skills to this older business and has now elevated this thing to sky's the limit. You know, right. people are always putting in shit like that in Arizona. They buy a house and they build another one in the backyard. It's crazy. So, I mean, it's just so much opportunity with things. And even if it's not in the same, like not another septic company, but picking up like a small plumbing or HVAC company, if you know home service or skilled trade stuff like that, it's a knowledge base of running that kind of business. What they're actually doing out in the fields, you hire the tradesmen to be able to do that. You don't have to be the person out pumping septic tanks. I don't go pump them, but I know how to run the business side of this. And it's a great place of employment for people that do have that skill set. So that's something huge too, to look up. Do you know who Cody Sanchez is? I don't. Follow her on Instagram. She has the coolest videos ever, but she's a woman that is a, like this huge proponent of like buy laundromats and like dirty small businesses, like car washes and these little sleeper businesses that people think, what are you really going to do with that? You know, like uh -huh. you can pick them up for nothing. You hire the people to work in them. You don't really have to do a whole lot other than, you know, hire good managers to do these things. And they're cash cows because people are always going to use these kinds of services. It's the same thing with the trades business. It's not going anywhere. If they become fewer and far in between for excavating it, even even finding people that have run excavators before, you know, you can start charging way more money for that because supply and demand, you know. Yeah. So another whole aspect to that is that the baby boomers, which are a significant portion of the population, are retiring and or dying off. Yeah. And as a result, there is a lot of business and real estate that is going to change hands over the next several years. Yeah. Isn't that supposed to be like the biggest exchange of wealth? Yeah. Like trillion ever? dollars. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, a couple of the people that I follow, you know, and I actually have to get a little bit more involved because buying that business is like the key to expanding rapidly. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Why bootstrap and start another one when you can buy one and just put a little fire on the, you know, a little gas on the fire that's there and just blow it up already. You know, right. you've got, you're buying people in those things. I, I see too, like trades businesses, people come to work here. They're like, this is not normal. It's almost weird, you know, cause you're like, tell me about your family. Like, they're like, what? You know, like the fact that you know their name and what kind of coffee they like in the morning, you know, like it's, it doesn't take much to create a beautiful work culture where people will be like, uh, yes. And what else can I do for you? You know, because people, people want to feel appreciated. That's something I think in these industries too, that is a hard time attracting people to come in and work because it's not genuinely a real touchy feely type of industry. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I point, I give you this uh, on our pumpers page thing. It's like the septic page on Facebook uh, around this time of year. People are always like, what do you do for a Christmas bonus? Like, what do you give your employees? You know, everybody's asking questions. And it's so funny because these old guys like, you know, John and Joe are like, I give them a shovel and a job, you know, like, <laughs> their Christmas. <laughs> But then, you know, like you'll have the women that'll chime in there that'll be like, oh, we provide snacks in the break room and we do, you know, waters and we do like team lunches. And there's like that little bit that if you can create a good work culture, people will keep coming back to that. People want to feel appreciated. I think it's like one of the biggest movements ever in work that people aren't motivated just by money. Like I want to come there. I want to know that you appreciate me and that I'm part of something. Absolutely.
I agree. It's funny. I'm just thinking about all the chocolate stuff I put out for um, my office guys. And I'm like, <laughs> making you guys addicted with all the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> they love it. And it's such like tiny things. I spend less than $100 a month, really, in the grand scheme of things that is pennies. It's nothing to be able for them to come in and be able to grab a soda or a beer out of the fridge or something and come in and like sit down and like relax a little bit before you go home. You don't know sometimes what they're going home to. Sometimes guys will come in here and just sit and bullshit for two hours. And I'm uh -huh. like, at least they feel comfortable being in this area where, you know, it, there's obviously a good culture here. I saw a post this weekend that said uh, the the health of your culture is how your employees feel about going to work on Monday morning. Like, do they want to go to work? Do they, are they anxious about going to work? Do they hate Monday mornings? Like, or is Monday mornings like a great start to a new week? You know, I was like, man, if everybody would just kind of think about that, even as owners, sometimes, you know, we've all been in places where we're like, oh, I don't want to go to work on Monday, no. you know? And a lot of times it's things that we can change and we can move around or we can have different conversations or bring in different people if you've got cancers inside of your business and change that. It's yeah. really just a quick decision to be able to do that a lot of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Because it will tear you apart. Well, what is going on with your business? Is there anything exciting going on? Anything that you're excited about that's coming down the pipe? You celebrating how yes. many years of business this year? So I think we're at like 20, 25, I guess 25. No, 24, 1999, January of 99. So we're like a wow. 24 year. So um, one of my First new of all, before yeah. you just say, and so it was only 24 years. Do you know what the statistics are that businesses actually last 24 I years? Do. I hear them over and over and over again from Cardone uh, Ventures. And yeah, absolutely. It's not a lot. It's not a it's lot. It's like none. Yeah. <laughs> You're closer to the none part than yeah. the everybody part. Yeah. So congratulations to you because we also sometimes suck at celebrating our successes. And that is something that I hope you guys celebrate a lot because it's something to really be proud of. Thank you so much. Sure. So our big, our big thing that I'm really excited about is my new hire just got us set up for state, county, and federal work. Ooh. So we haven't even done our first bid yet. And we're, pro we're probably not 100% through all of it. I think the county, we're okay. The state, something about an apprenticeship program I have to pay into. Federal, I think we might actually be good. But we're, we're on the cusp of starting to be able to bid for government work. Nice. Yeah. So I think that's a big deal. Yeah. What makes you excited about that? Well, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, everybody's got to pay their taxes and that and the and the and the government works always going on. So that's no matter no matter what. So I feel mm -hmm. like it's going to be a very solid stream of income. Yep. It's another stream of income, so it's just another revenue stream, but I mm -hmm. think it's a very solid one. And yeah. one that a lot of people don't take the effort to get into. Bingo. Huge, 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 huge. Because sometimes when people, when they send out contracts or they put all that stuff out to bid, those bid packets, I mean, even to pump grease traps, I have some of those too. Like, they're like two yeah. inches thick. You're like, I don't even understand what the fuck they're even saying in this thing. Like, I don't even know what it means. But being able to go through that, even pay somebody, the first contract that I got was for HUD. And it was like in 2012 when everything went to shit and they were like, like starting to sell off all the houses that they had accumulated. It was like 11, 2011, 2012, but they had kept sending these bids out. And I was like, oh my gosh, like these guys are so annoying, but I'm not reading this whole pack. Like it scared the shit out of me because it was so big, but it was that federal level of stuff that I was like, I... I don't even know if I qualify for this, but because I simply filled it out and turned it in 
we got that job and it was hundreds of thousands of dollars of work by the time it was all said and done. Nice. And it went through three different companies, but they would pass our names on to the new companies that got the bids for the federal level. And then we just go to work for them. It was the exact same work because we had gotten in with them at that level. So the work that you even bid on that you think of just spawns so much more work down the road. It's crazy. I love that. And it gives you great street cred too, because you can be like, hey, I do work for this city. I'm in city of Mesa or city of Phoenix. And then you bid on city of Chandler and they're like, oh, well they do Phoenix and Mesa. So, you know, it's not always just the rock bottom price on those things too. Right, absolutely. And you can see what other people bid for because it's all public record from the years beforehand. Oh. So, so yeah. So we're for getting you. <laughs> and and the guy that I hired is doing an amazing job uh, putting it together. So I'm really interested to to keep that moving forward and actually start getting some of those jobs and seeing seeing how we make out with that. But I'm I'm assuming the best. That is incredible. People that are really good about doing those contract things too are really good with grants. So like people, like they're written very similarly. So yeah. just a little heads up. I don't know if he's into things like that, but I used to write grants on it. It's like, like when I started getting into the contract stuff of things, I'm like, it's just like grant writing, like the stuff that you have to write out for things. I'm like, interesting. Cause there's tons of grant money for women that are in trades and construction business we'll stuff. So that. Those are cool little avenues to go down too. So if you're a woman that's in those things, look that stuff up all the time. There, There's different kinds of websites. There's one called Skip that promotes all kinds of stuff. You can put in kind of like what industry you're in and like if you're a certain ethnicity or certain size of business or things like that. And then they'll just ping you when there's grants that come up that you may be eligible to apply for. Okay. Just really writing cool it down. Grants are free money, people, and everybody likes that. Free That's always, always fun. nice. <laughs> very awesome, very awesome. Well, if people want to connect with you, Deborah, where is a great place for them to be able to find you? Well, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so I guess Turned it just up. depends on, are you a professional? Are you a homeowner? Are you, you know, are you a business person? So it just, really depends, but we're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And if you are like, if you're somebody that's like, okay, well, she's in New Jersey and I'm in Arizona. So I don't know. And I'm like, you're in the trades industry. Most of the people I follow on my trades page are other people that are in my same industry or very similar because you can get so many ideas from what people are posting, what people are talking about, and you can make some excellent friends through those social media platforms. We were introduced through a business coach. So, Absolutely. you know, like you just never shout out, shout out, shout out to Mary Lynn, but you just never know who you're going to run into with these things. Like how fun would it be if there's just a bunch of ladies, which is the whole point of ladies kicking ass, that you just get together and you're able to have these kinds of conversations you know, a lot of time. how many times do you talk to people that aren't in the trades industry, like other women, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, you know, I mean, I really don't have a lot of conversations with women in the trades at all. Really? Yeah, not at all. I think a lot of women are very kind of isolated in that, like many times you're working in the office, or even if you're out in the field, you're kind of in an isolated position. It's not like there's a ton of other women in there that you're sitting down having conversations with. And a lot of times we don't get the opportunity to be able to meet a lot of other women. And there's so many cool women that work in the trades industries that just so much fun. We'll put something together and it would be so fun for everybody to be able to get to know each other and bounce ideas off of each other. We do different things. I do excavation and septic and you're doing all of your stuff. I, even the stuff that you know about real estate. I'm like, oh, I ask her questions about real estate. You know, it's just different ways that people are handling things. You know, many times you learn things from people that are way not even in the same industry as you, but you realize, oh shit, I could apply you know, that to my business. Tony Robbins tells you to talk to people completely different industries, like people that seem to have absolutely no connection because there's so much to take away from people that have no apparent connection to what you do whatsoever. Yes. It's, true. it's 
So true. Through Tony's organization, and now we're doing a lot of stuff with Brendan Burchard's organization too. The people that like you gravitate to and start having these conversations many times are not even remotely close to what it is that I do all day long, right, but they find things fascinating and vice versa. And you're like, what a brilliant idea. Or even just telling people what you're struggling with when you're part of groups like this. Yep. They, everybody wants to help each other out. Like, hey, how can I help you with it? Just like you saying the government contract stuff. I'm like, ooh, and then you could do this and then you could do this. And it's things that you may not even think about, but because you mentioned something, Somebody might have a brother's brother's brother that knows how to do this. That right. there's a connection. Somebody knows how to do it all. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big group of people, but you can find them. But you got to put yourself out there and be able to have those conversations and really be raw about what your business is. You know, if you're struggling with things, find somebody else that's in business and maybe has been doing it a little bit longer, or somebody that you admire that you can reach out to. Because most business owners want to help other people. They really do. I agree with that completely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's great. Well, thank you so much. And Deborah, at the end of every podcast, I always ask every woman this question because I'm fascinated with the way that people answer these questions. It is a um, project, a heart project I am working on right now. I am writing a book about everyday women that are out there kicking ass and doing really cool things like we get to do every single day. So when you hear the phrase ladies kicking ass, what does that mean to you? That means, I guess, women out in the world making it happen. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. Making it happen. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you're just out there, making it happen and kicking ass. Yes. Because not, not everybody not, is. Yes. Lots of people talk about doing things. It's a whole nother level to take action and really make it happen. So yes, it's the movers. It's not the so, talkers. So Grant, so Grant Cardone, who's somebody that I follow very closely, you know, that yeah. would be like a 10 X thing. So yeah. kicking ass, 10 Xing it. Yes. You know, not just going at level one. Killing it. Killing it. Killing it. And 10X is easier than 2X. And I think once you get out of that mentality of like, no, oh, I kind of do a little bit and really pour it on. It's amazing what you're capable of doing. And that's why I can't wait to share the stories of the women that are just like you, Deborah, that are out there doing really cool things that have owned an excavating business for 20 plus years and they're still going and they're that top statistic of you know, people that have a business and it's still running. You've been through COVID. You've been through the crash, like all those things. And you've still kept it going. There's magic behind that business that sadly, I think a lot, not enough people talk about. So thank you so much for spending your time with us here and talking about your business and the trades industries and definitely connect with Deborah. I will put all of her links in the show notes here. Reach out to her. She's phenomenal. She's just super fun to have a conversation with. Um, and until next time, keep kicking some ass. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. <laughs>